Praise the Lord, everyone. Thanks for being with us at Bible study night. Great to see you all this nice, warm afternoon. Appreciate you guys making an effort to be in church, putting the word in your system here in the middle of the week. I want to remind you, Golden Plus carrying dinner at the Annex Saturday, August 26th from 4 to 6 p.m. And then there is a student service coming up Sunday, August 27th, 4 p.m. You're not going to want to miss it. Please be a part of that. Come out, support the youth. They put in a lot of work. They do great work. And come worship. Be with them. Gather together, hear the word. And then men's conference coming up September 14th through the 16th in Piedmont, Missouri. So if you're a guy and you're available, make an effort to be at men's conference. It's going to be at an awesome campground, and it's going to be a great time. It's going to be a little different than usual, but it's going to be um, speaking out a nice change. A nice change for guys just to hang out, get together, be together, worship together. It'll be a good time. Tonight we want to go to prayer. We want to remember Sister Woods, who's going through rehab. And Sandy Pruitt, she had a stroke, so we want to lift her up in prayer. And Billy Bennington, I believe, has a hernia, which many of you know that Ed Bennington just had hernia surgery and is recovering from that. So we want to pray against the hernia virus going around in that family, you know. But uh, we want to lift them up in prayer, obviously. Serious stuff. Um, Anyone else got a prayer request they would like to mention? Yes. Alexa's sick tonight. Let's pray for her. If you got a need online, put it in the comments. We'd love to pray with you about that. Well, if you'd stand with me, let's lift up these needs. Ask the Lord to touch them, to minister to them, to be with us. Lord, we love you. We're so grateful we can call upon you, Lord. That you, We're so grateful you hear us every time. Lord, we commit every one of these needs into your love, into your mercy, into your wisdom, into your authority. These are your needs, oh God, that we commit unto you. We pray over Sister Woods tonight, going through rehab. Lord, we ask you to be with her through this process. Let this process go easy and smooth for her. We pray you would be with her, saturate her with peace and help tonight. Lord, I pray over Sandy Pruitt. Do you see the stroke that she had had? And we're praying, Lord, a quick recovery. We're praying a healing work in her body that cannot be undone. We, Lord, lift her up before your throne, asking you to have mercy in her situation. Lord, we pray over Billy Bennington and Ed Bennington. You see where they're at tonight, dealing with these hernia issues, recovering from hernia surgery and dealing with the hernia in present time. We pray your healing virtue would just saturate them and overshadow them. We pray you would be with them and give them peace and give them comfort, give them strength, give them what they need tonight, Lord. We lift them up unto you, Lord, asking to have mercy on them and heal their bodies. We pray over Alexa tonight, Lord, not feeling well. We pray you would heal her body, step into her situation. We pray you would show yourself strong on her behalf, Lord, and smite down whatever these symptoms are, Lord, and bring peace and healing to her body. We thank you for doing it, and we thank you for hearing us, and we give you all the praise and glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you for praying. Tonight we're continuing our series called A Glorious Church. And our lesson tonight is on 3.3, titled The Church in Action. The church should be an actionable church. We should be moving. We should be doing the will of God. We're going to be reading out of Matthew chapter 8 or 28, verse 19 through 20. 
which says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So Jesus is giving us some insight of what he wants us to do as a part of the church. Jesus commissioned his disciples to take the gospel everywhere to everyone. And our key takeaway tonight is that we, as the body of Christ, should continue to proclaim the gospel to everyone that we can. You know, if someone were to ask you, beside the gospel, what is the best news you have heard in your life? You ever thought about that? The best news you've heard in your life beside the gospel. She said yes. He's going to make it. We're expecting a lot of good news that comes in life in certain situations that we should be thankful for. We're thankful for the gospel, and we're thankful for moments in life that give us an opportunity to reflect and to appreciate the blessings that God has given us. In 490 BC, the Persians invaded Greece, bringing Greece under the control of the Persian Empire. And even though there were many self-governing cities in Greece, the Athenians were affected most by this invasion. We're speaking of the Battle of the Marathon. This Battle of Marathon was a key battle that turned the tide of the first Greco-Persian War because the outnumbered Athenians famously defeated the Persian armies on the beach of Marathon. Now, this defeat did not entirely wipe out the Persians, not even close, but it did significantly increase the Athenians' moral, their, their, their morale, sorry. They were a little ecstatic because they had won a battle. They were excited. Their victory in this encounter proved that the Greeks could resist the Persians and even defeat them on the battlefield. They were not left helpless. Now, Marathon was located about 25 miles from Athens. And the story goes that a messenger named Pheidippides, Pheidippides, say that five times really fast. He was assigned to carry the good news back to the Athenians, and Pheidippides quickly ran south to Athens, but as soon as he arrived and he gave the good news, he collapsed and he died immediately after bringing the good news to the Athenians. Now, this good news brought relief and comfort to them, and they were definitely saddened for his passing, but they were thankful that they had good news. They had relief that we had won a victory. Now, this story is more than just a Greek history lesson. In the New Testament, we know that the New Testament was written in Greek instead of Hebrew to communicate the gospel to as many people as possible. The Greek language was an important means of communication. And when the Greeks, or when the Romans rather, conquered the Greeks in 146 BC, they recognized the value of the Greek language and they wanted to continue speaking and writing in it. And as a result, the New Testament was intentionally written in Greek. Greek words with biblical significance were used to describe Pheidippides. And since his message was one of good news, the Greek word 
Yuan Galeon was likely used. This word is usually translated as the gospel in English. And so it means good news. It means victory. And so New Testament authors use this euangelion to present the message of Jesus overcoming the forces of sin and death. His message, his victory, is good news for all humanity. When Jesus told his disciples to preach the gospel, he called them apostles, which referred to a messenger, someone sent forth with orders, just as Philippides was sent forth as a messenger carrying good news, Jesus has sent us into the world as his messengers to send his good news to his people. We are messengers of a new kingdom, and that's the kingdom of God. Before Jesus' ascension into heaven, Jesus reminded the disciples of his purpose. He reminded them of his reason for coming to earth in the fleshly form because he came to seek and to save those that were lost and he had to suffer and die and he rose from the dead to accomplish his mission. Now in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, after the 12 disciples got finished discussing the identity of Jesus as the Messiah, Jesus' ministry took a sudden turn toward Jerusalem where he would head to a cross. And along this journey, Jesus encountered many groups of people, many Jewish groups. We hear the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Herodians and His encounters with these people became more frequent and they became harsher as time went on. In Luke 9, starting at verse 18, after Peter confessed Jesus as the Messiah, Jesus predicted his own death to the disciples. Verse 18 of Luke chapter 9 says, And it came to pass, as he was alone praying, his disciples were with him. And he asked them, saying, Whom say the people that I am? They answer and said, John the Baptist. But some say Elias, and others say that one of the old prophets is risen again. He said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Peter answering, The Christ of God. And he straightly charged them, commanded them to tell no man that thing, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things, and be rejected of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be slain and be raised the third day. Day. So Jesus is predicting his own death. He's predicting his own resurrection. And then just a little later, when he's speaking to a rather much larger crowd, he invited those that were believers, those that believed, to take up their cross daily and follow him. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. And he said to them all, if any man will come after me, Let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. Now, in today's society, the cross has become somewhat romanticized by modern Christians as a sign of faith and hope. Just put the cross bumper sticker on the back of your car and we can check the box that we know they're legit believers because they have the bumper sticker. But sometimes it's unspeaking unspeaking jokingly here where we know that the cross is much more than just a little picture against a car. Because in Jesus' time his audience would know that the cross reminded them of all the condemned individuals, all going to be picking up their cross while they were going to soon die by the hand of the Romans and the death penalty that came along with it. They understood what the cross meant. 
it wasn't something lightly to be taken. It was pain. It was death. It was a symbol of suffering. And here's Jesus saying, deny yourself, pick up your cross, and come follow me if you actually want to save your life. He was challenging perspectives of what it means to have a meaningful life. Luke records the miracle on the Mount of Transfiguration. It's Peter, James, and John were with him where they saw Jesus glorified as he was praying. Moses and Elijah appeared alongside Jesus and spoke to him about his death that would soon happen. Luke 9, verse 32, But Peter and they that were with him were heavy with sleep. And when they were awake, they saw his glory and the two men that stood with him. And it came to pass, as they departed from him, Peter said unto Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. And let us make three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elias, not knowing what he said. And while he thus spoke, there came a cloud and overshadowed them, and they feared as they entered into the cloud. And there came a voice out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. The disciples were on the mountain, and they heard all this. They heard God's voice saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. They witnessed all the miraculous things that were taking place. But sadly, they didn't always listen. Because Jesus' mission was to die in Jerusalem, and God's Spirit was confirming his mission to the disciples. But they just weren't understanding what exactly his intentions were. And as we close Luke 9, Jesus intentionally set out for Jerusalem, knowing full and well what was awaiting for him. His mission was to give his life for others by enduring the cross, but rather his disciples weren't being very supportive all the time. They had some shortcomings. They fell asleep at inappropriate times. They argued over which of them would be the greatest, Luke 9, 46. Then there arose a reasoning among them. Which of them should be greatest? And Jesus, perceiving the thought of their heart, took a child and set him by him, and said unto them, Whosoever shall receive this child in my name receiveth me, and whosoever shall receive me receiveth him that sent me. For he that is least among you all, the same shall be great. So if you want to be great, you got to go down to the least. And so he's really challenging their perspectives. The disciples also rebuked others inappropriately. Luke 9, 49. And John answered and said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and we forbade him, because he followeth not with us. And Jesus said unto him, Forbid him not, for he that is not against us is for us. And so the disciples are often getting their perceptions and their reality wrong from the intentions and motives that Jesus had planned for them. They also offered to misuse their authority that was given unto them against the Samaritans. Luke 9, verse 51. And it came to pass, when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face. And they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Jesus came to save people, to deliver people, to bring, bring peace to people, and go to the cross on these people's behalf 
and the disciples are ready to burn them to the ground. It's like, where were their perspective at? Didn't they understand the mercy of Jesus in that it, it endures forever? But they always wanted to seem like they had the right perspective and they wanted to, they wanted to use their authority, but they were often in the wrong position. They were often with the wrong motive and the wrong mentality when approaching Jesus' intentions. The 12 disciples completely missed his mission many times, even though they traveled with him for three years. Side by side, eating, sleeping, living together, three years, and they missed his intentions, his mission, what he came to accomplish. They just missed the mark. That means if we're not careful, we can come to church all our lives. We can sit in the same pew, and we can even mix it up every once in a while and switch sides, and we can still miss what Jesus has called us to do and who he desires us to be. Because just because you have a feeling, well, maybe your feeling is not in alignment with reality. You know, strong people that are, that are angered or they're going through tough emotions, they're, they have really strong emotions. And if they're not careful, they can feel like their emotions are justification for how they should conduct themselves. Or it gives them liberty to go and live off their feelings just because they feel a certain way or they have a mentality of a certain way. But that's why it's important we bring our feelings, our mentality, and we subject it into the Word of God, and we allow that to be our first filter. If it doesn't align with that, we don't participate. We don't want to go there. It never ends up good when we cross that barrier. What does it mean to live your life intentionally and purposely for Jesus? How can we be more intentional in life and be more purposeful using our life as an instrument for God's glory? If we're going to truly understand how Jesus is his death his burial and resurrection are good news. We have to understand the bad news that confronts us all. Because certainly Jesus is our Savior, but if he's our Savior, that must mean we have to be saved from something. And we are saved from the evilness of sin. You know, when a firefighter rescues someone trapped in a burning building, the firefighter saves the person from being burned alive. That's their job, to go in and get the people out of the fire, put the fire out, and hope all is well, and we can move forward from here, but we want to make sure people are protected at all costs. In the same manner, Jesus has come, and he has saved us from the guilt of sin, which is con contrary to God's law. Sin disagrees with God's nature. And since God is just, his standard is perfect. And we want to obtain to his standard because the Greek word for sin implies an archer missing the mark. Someone that has aimed for a target and they come up short. They did not hit the target. Maybe they missed by just a few inches or maybe they weren't even close. But when it comes to our walk with God, each and every one of us has missed the mark. So each one of us bears the guilt of sin. Our genealogy does not grant us from missing the mark or it doesn't give us a get out of sin card just because we were born into a certain family or we came from a certain home. But Romans 4.23 says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 5.12 says, wherefore, as by one man centered into the world, 
and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. There's no doubt that we are sinners. It's in our nature, and we need a Savior. But thanks to God, the guilt of sin is removed because God says in Colossians 2, verse 13 through 14, And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. He took all our sin, all our guilt, all our shame, and he says, I'll bear that burden. I'll take it, and I'll go to the cross for you. We got a video of Randall Lee. He's the director of promotions for the UPCI Missouri Youth Department, giving us some insight into living a overcoming life. Let's take a look. Philippians 3 and 14, Paul says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. In my mind, this paints the picture of a target having a goal in mind and a projected end. It's the goal of every archer and marksman to hit the target. But many times there are obstacles and distractions that cause one to miss the mark that they are aiming for. In life, when filled with the Holy Ghost, we have the power and the ability to hit that target, to reach the mark that God has called us to. But often sin in our life will cause us to miss the mark that we are pressing toward. You see, sin is a plague that we all must face. Romans 3 and 23 says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But I'm so thankful that the scripture doesn't stop there. After being told that we all have sinned, verse 24 brings hope when it says that we are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Having sin in our life... That is missing the mark of what God has called us to be. But when we, but we don't have to live our life in sin. 1 John 1 and 9 makes a promise that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Through Christ Jesus and His blood shed on Calvary, we find forgiveness. In His name, our sins can be washed away. And through His Spirit, we have the power to overcome sin. We can live every day understanding that His mercies are new every morning, starting each day with a new hope and a new opportunity to press again toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. Every morning, new opportunity, new mission ahead of us to get sin out of our life, put Jesus at the forefront of our life where he belongs. Collisions, Colossians excuse me, 3, 5 says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil, a conspicuance, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Our job is to destroy the works of sin in our lives so we can continually be just like Jesus, to be more like him. We put off our nature, we embrace his nature, and we continue to learn to be more like him. We may have missed the mark, just like some of the disciples missed the motives of Jesus or his intentions, but we can continue learning and growing, getting close to him and getting that correction that we need. Because sometimes we need correction because the way we've been doing it just isn't working. And we've been making a mess of things. And we need someone to direct us into the right path where we can get the help we need so we can get to where we need to go. So let's get close to Jesus. Let's get close to Jesus. You know, they call it, the gospel is, is the good news. This is what is uh, the, the translation of that term. What's the best, besides the gospel, what is the best news you've ever gotten? 
thing about this, the best news I ever got. Like, just the first thing that popped into your head. Say it again. You're, exactly. Uh, Savannah says my kids, the, the adoption went through, it's, they're yours. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yes, healthy kids. Yeah, yep. That's what a mama wants to hear. Everybody okay? Yep, you're good. Yeah, awesome. I remember um, vividly whenever I found out we were pregnant. And um, it was not at all what I was expecting to hear. <laughs> not that it was an accident, but it certainly wasn't the information I was wanting. I was expecting at that moment when I walked in the garage and she was standing there. She's like, "Guess what? Our world's about to change." <laughs> okay, <laughs> it's been 13 years. Here we go. Best news. Somebody else. Dad made it through surgery and is alive. Awesome. Awesome. Good news. Good news. The good news that we are saved, that we have salvation, that it is secure. It's within our grasp. Not the, anything that we did for it, but that we. When we accepted that, and it changed our lives. You know, we've talked over the, uh, over the years in this classroom about um, the, the fracture that sin caused in the relationship between the creator and the creation. And it wasn't just in the, the humanity, us, the homo sapien, but it was in everything. The scripture says that the earth was cursed because of the sin of man. We were the ones given dominion, remember, in, this, in the, uh, the garden. We were the ones given dominion. And so whenever we messed up, that passed all the way down through everything that was under the authority of Adam. Right to the core of what the earth is. And so that gospel message doesn't just affect us in its humanity, but it works to mend everything. Let's go to Romans chapter 8, uh, verse 18. Let's start with verse 18. Uh, Paul's writing, he says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly awaits the revealing of the sons of God. He's saying everything around us is with bated breath waiting to see what happens with us. We're the ones holding the key here. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, because the creation itself also will be delivered from bondage of corruption into glorious liberty of the children of God. In verse 22, he says, For we know that all creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even ourselves, groan within ourselves, eagerly awaiting for the adoption and the redemption of our body. The negativity of, of, of sin, the negative effects of sin, the, the weeds, the mosquitoes, the Ebola virus, all the, the negativity of life, the dysfunction and the, and the disunity, where everything stopped and, and, and got ripped, that gets fixed at the end where eternity meets salvation. This is not, I, I, we, we, we've talked about this in the past, but the world that we're living in is not the world God designed for us. This is not what he the, 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 the brokenness was not what he designed for us. Death and disconnection was not in God's menu whenever he was looking at the drop down for what we have in, in, our, in our future. And so this is why we're eagerly awaiting. Even so, come soon, Lord Jesus. Because I want that reconnection to happen. I want to go back to where we were designed to be. The relationship that was designed to be 
for me. And this is the eagerness that Paul's talking about. Not just the ground looking forward to, to working without weeds, but for the humanity. I want to be delivered from this bondage that we live in. And <laughs> there are days whenever I say, you know, this would be a good day. If you wanted to come back, I, I'm, I'm going to give you all permission. If, you need, if you're looking for anything from me, I'm going to say, pull the trigger, blow the horn. I'm ready to go. This, this is the beautiful thing about salvation is because it is a taste of what we will experience in the future. It's a taste, that, 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 that beauty of forgiveness, that relief of forgiveness, and that release that happens in the Spirit. Whenever we, when we sit in the presence of the Lord, and we're just basking, we're marinating in His presence, and, and we're, we're experiencing the emotion that comes along with that. The pastor talks about the, the Holy Ghost um, Cheerios, or the, you get the goosebumps, or, or just... just a, a, a feeling of relief and peace when we're in the presence of the Lord. That's just a taste of what we have to look forward to. Man, I, I can't wait to see Jesus. Can't wait to see Jesus. You know, it's it's incumbent upon us. Uh, I love that word, incumbent. It's a big carrying word. It's a, it's a wheelbarrow of a word. It's incumbent upon us to take what we experience and export it out. I, I was uh, talking with some friends of mine. We were talking about uh, different people groups throughout the world and talking about different countries and what they export. And somebody mentioned the Philippines, the island nation uh, in the Pacific, that their greatest export is not minerals, it's not oil, it's not stuff, it's people. Their greatest export is the people that they send out, out of their, their national borders to do work in other countries. And the, the, expat, the, the, the expat population of the Philippines supports the country of the Philippines. So whenever they're not working in uh, Saudi Arabia or Europe or, or the Middle East someplace else or Asia, they're not supporting their families back at home. We are the export of the church. And what we have within us, what we have experienced through the power of God, this is what Matthew 28 is all about. This is the commission. Go ye and teach. Make disciples. Baptize. Teach them to observe all the things he says in Matthew 28, uh, 20. Teach them to deserve all the stuff that I've taught you. You've got it in you. Now go do something with it. And if you feel like, oh, man, don't, I, I'm not going to stand up there. I don't need a podium. I don't want a mic. You don't have to. Given the opportunity to plant seed, you're creating disciples. Given the opportunity to speak into somebody's life, you're doing exactly what Matthew 28, 19 says. Go into all nations, make disciples, baptize them, give them the opportunity to experience what you've experienced. And don't feel like, oh man, I, 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 I missed the opportunity to say what I wanted to say to them. I'll never have that opportunity again. Don't bear that burden. Expect God to give you the opportunity to speak. Gabe, I, I, I love what you do when you're on the line doing what you do all day long. Gabe's looking for opportunities to speak into somebody's life. And we have baptized people that have been just co-workers. The seed's planted, the work's done, and then it's the Lord's opportunity to do with what you have put out there. I, I want to take a minute just to go through the, the Great Commission as it shows up in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I don't think I've ever done this where I've, I've uh, approached all three of these uh, perspectives. It's just interesting to me. Uh, so Matthew 28, 19, we, we, we know that. We're, we're familiar with that uh, section of Scripture. But let's go to Mark chapter 16. 
Uh, verse 15, let's start there. Go into all the world. This is Mark capturing um, the memories because Mark wasn't there. So he's taking what he's heard from others and writing it down. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Verse 16, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. These shine signs will accompany those who believe in my name. They'll drive out demons. They'll speak new tongues. They'll pick up snakes in their hands. And if they drink any deadly poison, it will not harm them. They'll lay hands on the sick and they will be made well. What we see in, in, in the life of Paul is exactly what happened in verse 18. Picking up sticks to throw on the fire. Snake, oh no, oh, okay, he's fine. God took care of him. But while we're here and, and we're, we're preaching the gospel, let's lay, we're going to lay hands on this sick person. The Lord's going to do a work in their life. They're going to recover. Let's go to Luke 24, verse 46. Same experience. He's giving the commission. This is Luke uh, uh, transferring the story um, in, his, in his book. He said to them, thus it is written. And thus is necessary for Christ to suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. The repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all the nations beginning in Jerusalem. He's speaking in the third person about himself. And you're going to be witnesses of these things. Behold, I have sent the, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you've been endued with power from on high. I, I, Stephen mentioned this in, in his section earlier in the, in the lesson. Jesus made it so clear. This is what's going to happen. Whenever he, the scripture says he set his face toward Jerusalem, he knew I, I, and, and gave them a laundry list. I, I, we can't make it too clear that I'm the Messiah because it's going to mess everything up. I, I got I to get my job done here. I can't be the, the rescuer until I'm the sacrifice. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus gives them, he, so we've gone through the whole process of, of sacrifice and redemption and resurrection, and Jesus is, is giving them the final, uh, the final agenda before he, he walks out the door. Uh, this, is, this is dad getting ready to go to work, and, and by the time I get home, this is what I need to have done. I want to see all this done. You're going to receive power. The Holy Spirit's going to come upon you, and you're going to be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, all the other parts of the earth. And, and this is the, 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 uh, the agenda. This is what you're going to be working on until I come back. And this is what happens. First, we have Jerusalem. The power of God's poured out. 3,000 are added to the church in one day. It's amazing. we got revival. We're having everything in common, and, and we're breaking bread amongst everybody. And people are coming to, to church, and... And they're getting healed, and it's just amazing what's happening. And then in Acts 8, we go to a little bit further out. We spread the region out into Judea and Samaria. And then, of course, later on, Acts 13, we get into Rome. We get into the rest of the Gentile nations. I want to hang out in, in Acts 8 for just a second. Peter and John um, hear about Philip's revival in Samaria. Remember, Stephen said that... that they went to Samaria, and they wouldn't take him in, that, in one of those villages. They were like, no, we don't want anything to do with you right now. And, and do we want to just burn it down since we're here and just keep on going? No, 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 I'm coming back. We're, you're going to come back and deal with this again. I, I, <laughs> I wonder if the Samaritan revival that Peter was in, and, and that, that Philip was in, was the village that they tried to burn down back a little bit ago. No, you're going to come back here and have revival. Peter and John needed to see what Philip was experiencing there so they could see it and know the Lord prophesied this. He said, this is going to happen. We're going to go to the Samaritans. And here we are. Revelation 5 and 9 says that every tribe, nation, language is going to be represented. That means that there are some indigenous um, People, two or three, left in some little hovel in the Amazon jungle someplace that nobody's ever found, but somehow they're going to hear the gospel. How amazing is that? 
we have to be careful that we don't discriminate. We don't hold back what we have been given. It took an angel to speak to Peter and get him out of bed and get him to Cornelius' house. It took a, a, a literal move of the supernatural to convince Peter that you need to do something with what you've been given. I'm not going to say shame on Peter because Peter had, he was dealing with a lot. But we have been given a lot and to whom much is given, we need to spread what we've been given. Share what we have been given by the kingdom. I want to make sure we, we say, I, I say this often, I just want to reiterate one of my candy sticks. If, the, if you feel like standing at the gas station at the pump that you should lean around the corner to the person on the other side and say, hey, just want you to know Jesus loves you. Hey, I, gotta, I, I just suddenly feel like that you need to be prayed for. Is there something I can pray with you about? Do not turn your back and focus on your gas cap. That is not you making that up. Don't, don't convince yourself, oh, that's the stupidest thing I've thought. I can't believe I thought about that. Oh, can't wait to tell my significant other. Can't be, I can't wait to write on Facebook that I thought I was going to pray for somebody in the gas station. Yes, please, would you please, if the Lord, if you are impressed in any fashion to share something about the Lord to somebody that you can't believe that this is getting ready to happen, just would you please just step out and go, I can't believe this is getting ready to happen. Here I go. Hey, hi. Can I just bother you for a second? And if they're like, you and your Christianity right wing craziness, I'm a blah, 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 then go, blessing on your head. And then focus on your gas cap. I, 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 I can assure you, if the Lord is prompting you because you are filled with the Holy Ghost, you have been baptized in his name, you are a child of his. If the Lord is prompting you to do something, he has an agenda. And it may not be yours for this day. Do something and trust the Lord to finish the work. Man, I feel like such an idiot. Not your problem. Not your problem. You know, the, 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 the process of baptism is so important. Um, whenever uh, in, in the Jewish culture, the, there, was the, there were ritual baths that were built into every village. Um, it was usually some type of a, a building. And, and we, we find these even today. There's, there's modern versions of these, but we also find them in archaeological uh, digs. Uh, it was a small building. There were steps that went down into a, a type of a, I don't want to say a hot tub, but it's basically got the, kind of the same size as a, a, a standard American hot tub. And, and it was used for all kinds of things. Um, you're pregnant, you have a baby, you, the, the, the book, uh, book of Leviticus says that you got to cleanse yourself before you go back into uh, population uh, for various other things, leprosy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so ritual bathing was part and parcel of the Jewish life, their culture. So it was um, not... It was not uh, peculiar for John to be saying to those who, to, when he was preaching, you need to be baptized. Because if someone was going to convert from, Jude from, from uh, a Gentile faith, per se, to Judaism, they're, if they're male, they're going to be circumcised. And they're going to go through a ritual bathing process to rinse themselves of their Gentile life. What was not normal was for the Sadducees and the Pharisees to be cleansed because they were already living their best life. They were already clean because they were fulfilling the law of Moses on a daily basis. I, I just exhale and I fulfill the law of Moses. And so whenever they show up in front of him to see what's going on, 
His response is not, oh, good, I've got some folks on my side. His response to them was, you guys got to get your act together. Let's, let's, let's go to, to, uh, to Matthew th- uh, chapter 3, Gage. Uh, let's start with uh, verse 5. All Jerusalem and Judea, the region around Jordan, come out to, to see John. They're baptized by him. They're confessing their sins. People are saying, I, I got to get my life right. Verse 7, when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to his baptisms, baptism, he says, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance, and do not think to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children of Abraham from these stones. Now the axe is laid to the tree, he says in verse 10. Every tree that doesn't bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not able to carry. He's going to baptize you in the Holy Spirit and with fire. His fan is in his hand. He's going to clean the threshing floor. He's saying to them, your righteousness is the filthy rags. You've got to be baptized. You can't live an overcoming life that the, what is being asked of you is not in the law. It is a completely different perspective. Your genealogies is not your righteousness. The kingdom of God is not something that we are born into. There's no grandchildren and, and, and aunts and uncles. There's only children of God. And this is the beauty of why we are still baptized to this day is because the same uh, authority of washing away happens in that baptismal tank. And do you realize we've had baptisms three weeks in a row? Isn't that amazing? People's lives getting changed. Amen. Amen. Pray for these kids, uh, the, 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 the students that have been baptized, uh, the adults that are being baptized. We want the Lord to do a, uh, continue to do a work in their lives, to protect what has been started in them. Swaddle them with your prayers that the Lord would continue to work in their lives. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You know, uh, I mentioned this already, but the, the disciples uh, were, were so focused. Everybody was so focused on uh, the political situation, just like we are today. What's going to be happening in Georgia this week? What's going to be happening in uh, 24? Uh, we, we got all kinds of, of questions and, and the Jewish people from, we go all the way back to the exile and the, the Babylonian empires, the Greeks, then the Romans uh, had, had ruled over with just a very small period of time that the Jewish people had ruled themselves between the, the Babylonian empire and the Roman empire. They were so focused on trying to get their own political uh, needs met that every time they looked at Jesus the disciples did it was through a filter of the, po- of the political the gospel is never politicized it's never politicized that filter that, that, that happens even today is nothing new because it's exactly what they were wanting from him this is what they, ke- they kept asking him are you going to restore your kingdom how about this week? Can we restore the kingdom this week? No, this is not what I'm here for. Okay, we'll come back and check with you in a couple of weeks. See if you've changed your mind. It's easy sometimes for us to get uh, triggered, if I can use that word, by social issues and political issues and start seeing people in those, uh, through those filters. This individual, this race, this culture group, this socioeconomic group, uh, this level of person, I'm going to look at them not from the gospel's perspective, but from society's perspective. And this is not biblical at all. The Bible is built on individual need for salvation regardless of color, creed, identity. I don't care if you've got sleeves and face tats. You need Jesus. 
you need Jesus. And I can't, I, I, I'm so grateful to see the Lord moving in people's lives. We, we look at, we look at uh, Aquila and Priscilla in the uh, book of Acts. These are two people who were just doing their job. They're just going around about their day. And they hook up with this dude named Apollos. And it's, it's possible that Apollos was the one who wrote the book of Hebrews. Some theologians uh, believe this. If that's the case, these are two people who engaged with a guy on the street, and he made a, 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 a contribution into the Hebrew mind of, how, of who Jesus is and how he connects to him in a way that nobody else could. Whenever you follow the, I'm getting excited. When you follow the biblical example for salvation and that specific piece for your life, the gospel, for every, everyone who believes, the Lord then takes the, the, the general call for salvation and becomes very laser focused on you as an individual. Now I'm going to, now that we have reconnected, I'm going to use you specifically to make a difference in somebody's life. And you don't know what that means at any given time. We don't know what the Lord has in store for us until we stand before his throne. Stand with me. You know, I, I, a lot of times I hear preachers say, oh, I can't wait till I get to heaven. I'm going to ask John all kinds of questions. I got questions for Peter. I can't wait to talk to Elijah. You know, what, what if you get there and they're like, oh, Stephen, I can't wait to hear about I, I, somebody was telling me about this story that happened to you that one time, and you, I, I just can't wait to hear this story. Every one of us have great stories of God's work in our lives. Every one of us have testimonies of what God has done through us. And if you're waiting to have, I don't know, the dead raised in front of you to give you some coolness factor, just keep living. Expecting God to use you for the kingdom, expecting God to do something amazing through you, your eyes will see the glory of the Lord. Lord Jesus, I thank you for giving us a, a, an actionable choice. Lord, you've given us a direction. You've given us an agenda. I'm so grateful for the gospel, Lord. I'm so grateful for the opportunity to share it. Lord, I thank you for teaching us. I thank you for calling us. Lord, I thank you for using us. You have taken us out of darkness and into your marvelous light, and we're so grateful for it today. I thank you for using us to impact those around us in whatever position, whatever path. Lord, however small, however great, Lord, we want to be used by you. We hear your commission. We hear your call. Lord, we submit to your authority. Use us for your glory. I thank you for what you're doing in Randolph County, Lord, what you're using TPC to do. We give you all the glory and the honor, Lord. You're worthy of our praise, worthy of our honor. We love you today in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Go be the church in Randolph County. God bless you. We'll see you, see you on Sunday.